Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Executive Producer Doha Goals and Executive Chairman Richard Atias and Associates, Richard Atias. Good morning. Good morning. How are you today? Okay, great. Did you have a, a good day yesterday? Where are the students? We are very calm this morning. Uh, okay. Okay, so um, I have the great pleasure to moderate the session, which I think is quite important topic because at the end of the day, what uh, countries, cities are doing by investing a lot of money to uh, try to organize sport events, big events, is also about building a brand and a legacy. So I will call on stage the great panelist I have the pleasure to, to have with me this morning. We have His Excellency Sheikh Saud bin Abdurrahman Al Thani, the Secretary General of the Qatar Olympic Committee. We have Boutros Brat Boutros Boutros, my dear friend from Dubai, the Senior Vice President of Emirate Airlines. Stephen Grayser, Richard Chapman, Professor Emeritus at Harvard Business School. Didi Corradini, the President of International Women's Forum and former Mayor of Salt Lake City. Bin Hu, a triple Paralympic champion high jump from China, and last but not least, Jim Sloman, the Chief Operating Officer of Sydney 20. Uh, sorry, Sydney 2000. Mm -hmm. And uh, at the time they will join, let's see a short video to uh, position our debate. Kanako. The theme of the 2010 World Cup in South Africa means it is time. This single event permanently recast the country in the eyes of the world. This is what global sporting events can do. They bring nations together in uniquely positive and productive ways foster new dialogues and promote solidarity among individuals, businesses, cities, and countries. Sport elevates what is best in us. And for the cities that host global events, what is best about that place is brought to life. The benefits cross all aspects of the city's economy, driving employment, Tourism, spurring momentum for economic and social progress, and far outlasting the length of the event itself. The imprints of these global sporting events continue to illuminate the fact that sport is all around us and part of our global DNA. Welcome. Uh, Sheikh Saoud, I will start by you. Can you make just a very quick introduction about uh, introducing what the uh, Qatar Olympic Committee is and what uh, is your day-to-day -day job, which as I know is very, very busy. Well, good morning to everybody. I'm glad to be here. Uh, Qatar Olympic Committee is in charge of the sports in Qatar and um, same thing we have as also we are in charge as a minister of sports so we don't have a ministry of sport here in Qatar and we are uh, our, under our umbrella, umbrella we have the federation, the clubs in Qatar and also we are coordinating all the sport events in Qatar and by this year we reach about 35 events every year. Excellent. Boutros, everybody knows about Emirates Airline which is by itself a brand. Uh, uh, what more can you tell us about what you do at Emirates Online and how it is related to sports? Actually, uh, I look after corporate communications where uh, include uh, all the communication mediums, which is, of course, including uh, sponsorship and uh, brand, which is part of today's uh, session. Uh, my department looks after uh, more than 60 brands uh, under the umbrella of Emirates Group. Of course, Emirates Airline is the main one. Uh, Didi, um, can you tell us more about what International Women's Forum is about and how this was related to your former position as a mayor of Salt Lake City? 
Sabah al khair wa ahlan wa sahla. Wow. Pleasure to be here with you this morning. Um, the International Women's Forum is in 26 countries. It's the premier women's leadership uh, organization worldwide. And uh, we are all about promoting leadership for women worldwide. And uh, it doesn't relate directly to having been the mayor of Salt Lake City, but uh, as you know, Salt Lake City hosted the 2002 Winter Olympic Games, so I bring a little bit of a different perspective for winter here. Um, but we bid for 1998 uh, Winter Games. We lost by three votes, and uh, we won on the first ballot for 2002, so that was very exciting. And my tie-in today is that uh, I'm now president of Women's Ski Jumping USA, and we led the worldwide effort to get ski jumping for women into the Olympics, and they will be jumping for the first time in Sochi 2014. And uh, Salt Lake City will be bidding again for the Olympic Games in 2026. Oh, this is a good information. So 2026? Excellent. So you will tell us how do you prepare yourself to to bid for 2026. Exactly. Excellent. Um, Stephen, I'll come to you in a minute because I will ask you in a few seconds and we'll start with you. Uh, so uh, if you allow me, maybe I will also um, uh, maybe go directly to Jim before because after I have a, 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 a more developed presentation about being who. Uh, Jim, what do you do today as, uh, as the CEO of Sydney, uh, to, after Sydney 2000? After you were, can you introduce yourself? Yeah, I uh, played that role in Sydney, and since then I've been doing consulting to a variety of events, including Beijing, <coughs> Athens, and particularly to London over the last eight years. I worked on the London bid and then have helped them through, as well as uh, a number of other events around the world. Uh, Bin Hu. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Ni hao. You, you came with a, a fabulous video who will uh, say in few images how inspirational athlete you are and that was a great leader you are in your country. So maybe we'll share first this video with our friends. Can we have the video? Thank you. The <laughs> 这也彻底改变了他的命运，但生性乐观的侯兵并没有离开运动场，反而更为积极地开始了跳高训练。一九九六年和二零零零年的残奥会，侯兵两次获得金牌，尤其是在一九九六年的残奥会上，他还创造了
，体味了古老的中华文明，也见证了中国不可阻挡的时代风采。这盛火跨越了历史的长河，今晚将在北京点亮所有人的梦想航程。此时此刻。炽烈的残奥会圣火即将在北京的夜空绽放，照亮同一个世界，同一个梦想。Continue the video. Yes, we want to see the flame. So let's go on. Bin Hu, what is the influence of the Paralympic Games? What do you think are the influence of the Paralympic Games? According to my own feeling, I think Paralympics brought lots of changes to the world. I went to lots of places in the world to the Paralympic Games and brought lots of gold medals. Many people asked me, "How come you can win lots of gold medals?" I think the changes happened actually um, happened when I was nine years old. I was really inspired by those people. You know, actually before that, I just lost my leg when I was nine years old. Thank you. Um, we will come back. Yes, I think you deserve a round of applause. I will come back to you in a few minutes. We'll talk about your foundation. We'll talk about uh, many other points. Stephen, before starting this uh, plenary, I would like to ask you as, a, as an expert, as our academic of the panel, how can we define really today uh, the notion of legacy and branding? Thank you. Uh, branding a nation through big sport is not new. In fact, it was initiated in 1936 or prior to 1936 by Nazi Germany, which wanted to have a more positive image. Uh, and the Olympics were the co-branding, as we would call it now, vehicle to do that. In my research, I've tried to develop a report card, if you will permit me, of subjects for a host country to consider and to be evaluated eventually. The first is sport in terms of participation, in terms of achievement for the host country, etc. The second these are brief by definition right here. Business in terms of development, infrastructure, tourism. So we're talking jobs, trade, and visitors. The third dimension or element is planning and operations such as preparation, uh, management such as security, ticketing, etc. Number four is the legacy for the nation, and we'll talk more about that, but obviously it includes things such as facilities after use, such as continuity of the external and internal business development, support itself in terms of continuing support, but what's really interesting under legacy for the nation and we saw a lot of this in London 2012, is national pride. And I know that that's big out here, uh, but it was very big in London 2012, inspiring a nation through hosting, through athlete performance, through favorable reactions of the people of, as Lord Coe described yesterday, of media and of visitors. L legacy is the biggest long-term area of opportunity for any city country that's trying to do this. Fifth and finally, 
is the political aspects, uh, what I call elevating's one's, elevating one's presence in terms of seats at global tables. And clearly that's something that has been in the minds of several countries, including China, uh, for certain purposes. But political aspects also include one's image externally, and that's a long conversation that we may not get to today, but it's an important element for those things such as national airlines, as well as other sponsors that wish to associate themselves, or as we in marketing call it, co-branding, with the big sports event. I wish to just add one example. There are big opportunities here. There are also risks. And I would cite India 2010 Commonwealth Games. And when the organizing committee was referenced at the opening ceremonies, the crowd booed the organizing committee, which kind of told you everything you needed to know. Can you open my wireless mic, please? Um, yes, okay. Do you think that in the middle of the uh, economic turmoil and crisis in Europe, UK was right to uh, organize the games and how it helped the uh, brand UK, the, Bra the Grand uh, Britain brand, about hosting these games? Hey, are you talking about which games are you talking about? Uh, the I Lord Coe that, and I share his view, which is in 2005, when they received the bid, I do not believe it could have been totally predictable I agree. that in 2008 there would be a massive swoon in financial markets and other things. I think one works on the best projections that one can with regard to how things are going to be when the big event is going to happen. Uh, it may be, my speculation, it may be a little easier here uh, looking 10 years from now to when the World Cup will be right here in Qatar so. because I don't think that the natural resources are going to run out. Okay. However, the global economic scene may be up and down. Sheikh Saud, uh, as uh, just Stephen mentioned about uh, projecting ourselves by 2022, but before 22, you are uh, involved in many, many bids. It would be great, by the way, to tell us uh, how many bids are now in process and what will be next. Um, so what is your strategy to integrate the legacy in your bids and all your bids? And also, how can we do you think we can measure the legacy of, um, uh, of an after an event and, and keep the momentum? Okay. First, I, I agree totally with what the doctor mentioned. And um, just to add a little bit, I think one of the reasons the, the big countries or the cities, any cities in the world, they bid for a big event or they would like to host a big event is really to speed up the process of the building the nation itself in terms of infrastructure, sport infrastructures, or any legacy that you would like to uh, you know, achieve from hosting big event. And always there is a great says, it says you can you know, move a mountain, but you cannot change the day of the opening ceremony. So that's why many of the big nations, you know, big cities, they would like always to host event. Either they have to modernize more their countries or they want to speed up the process of the infrastructure. Coming back to the question, I think in the terms to 2022, Qatar already will host the World Championship for FINA for swimming in 20, 2014. And then in 2015, we have the World Championship in handball. In 2016, we have uh, the World Championship of road cycling. And from there also, we are still having thinking about hosting events in 2018 and 2019, which is are already in the bid process. The legacy that we'd like to achieve and how we assure or how we are, uh, you know, want to measure what we planned from the beginning, I think the main idea, once you are wanting to host a big event, such as the World Cup for now for Qatar, or when we hosted the Asian Games, is to involve, you know, the planning for the legacy from the beginning. 
from the beginning when you are you know planning even to bid for uh, for an event and uh, you, you include the legacy within everything that you are planning for whether it will be a sport venues or whether it be any kind of programs that you want to do like i remember in the asian games when we uh, did the planning for the volunteer and the volunteer center just uh, we started the qatar volunteer center in 2004 after winning the to host the asian games and we saw the momentum and this is how we measure it after the asian games concluded we saw the volunteer center is increasing day by day and volunteer has become as um, a culture has become in qatar as something that not even in the sport event but also in any event qatar is hosting so this is you know some ways that you can measure uh, any um, any legacy and i think the the most important things you have to make sure that whatever legacy that you you build or you plan for or you set a kbis for you want to make sure that it will continue after the event itself and yesterday we heard from london that they introduced the cycling and now cycling has become so um, you know practice in london in, in every day or in, in weekends so this is something that, uh, you know, any cities is planning for any legacies. The sustainability of the legacy is very important. How many people, um, <clears throat> can you raise your hands, all the people who watch the opening ceremony of the London Olympics? And Beijing? More or less the same. So, <laughs> how do you think, Gigi and... and um, and also, Jim, how is the impact and the influence of the, just the opening ceremonies of the Games? I think the uh, impact is huge because it gives you a chance to introduce your city and your state to the world. And people do watch the opening ceremonies, I think, much more than the closing ceremonies. And um, it, it's an opportunity not to be missed for a city or a state. But is not becoming more and more a show, like a Hollywood show? Well, it's definitely a show because you feel as though you've got to outdo the last uh, Olympics <laughs> in your show. And, and uh, certainly we felt, how do we, because Nagano Olympics were just before us, how do we do better than Nagano? And I'm sure the folks that came after Beijing were saying, London was saying, my gosh, how do we outdo what Beijing said? So yes, there is that one-upsmanship, but uh, it, it's, uh, it's great. Jim, you wanted to react also, please. Uh, I the Sydney tried. opening it's, it's, ceremony was quite also a big thing at the time. It, it's, it's a real opportunity for you to showcase your city and your country. And you don't get that very often to the sort of audience you're talking about. And uh, hence it has become a, a huge show. And there's very, very much in every opening ceremony I've seen a national theme that runs through it. And uh, you're out there. I mean, Sydney was, Sydney was there and it put itself on the world map through the Olympic Games, and part of that was the, the opening ceremony that, that, that struck a real chord across the world. Yes, On that very subject, it is the opportunity to show one's face to the world and one's people uh, to many who may never come there, even as tourists later, etc. I would also note candidly that the smartest, one of the smartest things London 2012 did was not to try to beat, to, to outperform the 28, the 2008 Beijing opening ceremonies, mm -hmm. which were, as we say at the Vatican, sui generis uh, of their own nature. But what London did was try to do something distinctively British and UK, yeah. yeah. etc. Lord Coe reminded us yesterday that vision, I'm going back to the Sheikh's comments, vision is most important. Once you get agreement on the vision fairly early as it evolves, keep reminding people who want to make major changes in midstream of the planning cycle of what that vision is and stay with the vision. Thank you. Butros. I think there's another aspect, yeah. though, that I should just mention, and that is the opening ceremonies are an opportunity to dispel something of the image that the world might have of your city. So, for example, Salt Lake City is known just as Mormons 
and the how was, opening... How, was, how much was the cost of the opening at... Uh, oh, I don't remember. At Salt Lake City. But it gave us an opportunity What's to show the world that, that we were much, much more than just Mormons and that many non-Mormons also live in Salt Lake City. So it is an opportunity to broaden that perception that people already have of your city. How much cost uh, Sydney opening? And what did it cost? Yeah. About $50 million. Five zero? Sorry, five zero. London would have been twice that. I mean, I think in terms of opening ceremonies, the Asian Games opening ceremony here was one of the most wonderful events I've seen as well. I mean, it, it's not just Olympic Games. No, the costs are escalating, you know. Yeah. Boutros, how Dubai is doing? As, very well. <laughs> 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 we are very happy to hear that. So, is it yeah. recovering? Sorry? Is it recovering? Uh, recovering from what? You know, it's. <laughs> oh, you know, come on, uh, yeah, come on, come on. <laughs> Look, Dubai uh, no, I think, had, I think, had a recession I, I, on, the, I, on the press. No, I will, I, will, I will precise my questions. As everybody knows, unfortunately, and you know, I was living in Dubai for a year, so uh, I know quite well uh, Dubai. And we all have to say, because we are here talking in total transparency, but the image was quite a little bit damaged after 2008, 2009, with all this financial turmoil. How sport helped, if sport helped, to rebuild the image and to recover? Look, at the end of the day, uh, sports uh, plays a big part of any nation, uh, actually. Any sports you do, it adds to the reputation uh, of any nation, especially if you organize it well and you do it very well. Uh, I'm not here in a position to speak on behalf of Dubai, but I can say what happened in Dubai and uh, Dubai managed to restructure its loans, which by the way, the total loans of Dubai, they are less than uh, bailing out of one bank in Europe. So it's not a big deal. Uh, they managed to restructure their loans quickly. Uh, Dubai recovered all what it takes you to go and see the streets of Dubai to see the recovering and it's now uh, even ahead of 2008. Uh, sports, of course, or, uh, Dubai organize a lot of uh, good sports, and I see here uh, the main uh, emphasis is on Olympics, but they have, you have tens of other sports, which is small to even, sm uh, even uh, medium-sized sports that Dubai managed to host uh, last week. They had uh, the Parachuting Mondial, they had Swimming uh, World Cup, uh, so they had several uh, events which Dubai can afford, can service, and can really present to the world. And here, here, what I'd like just to mention quickly, you know, uh, of course, Olympics are big, FIFA are big, these are sports which pay for themselves, but I think maybe in a later stage, you need, somebody need to discuss the smaller sports which they really need support. How do you rec uh, react, Sheikh Saud and Boutros, on one of the proposals that President Sarkozy made yesterday, which is maybe to start to think about organizing big events at a regional level, and maybe having a great world events, with, uh, uh, I would say, competitions happening at the same time in Doha, in Dubai, in Bahrain, for example. Do you think it's feasible? And let's really put that with also the ego perspective. Talking about co-hosting. Yes, co-hosting. Okay, we, we have experience. We have seen in uh, the World Cup before between Japan and Korea, and we have seen also in UEFA, they are, you know, they have many events, they did co-hosting co for it. I think uh, it's, um, you know, it has a positive and a negative. But Especially. what will be the impact on building the legacy? Because then, not to avoid the confusion of who is taking the credit at the end oh, of the day. Yes. Well, I think planning from the beginning between the two nations or the two cities that will host and, you know, to emphasize which city will do in what part and what are the legacy that will be suitable for that city and, uh, and, and, and the event itself. But I think in the Olympic, um, uh, we never seen a co-hosting. For example, if we go from rank number one, the Olympic, and then uh, we have seen it only in World uh, Cup uh, for football and also in continental regional like the European uh, or the Cup, African the Cup, football, yes. or the African Cup. So I, I think it's, uh, it's a good idea uh, for the different uh, event or different sports. Uh, again, it depends on if the country itself or the city can afford to host or not. Uh, and this is also, again, go back to lowering the cost of the host nation. And then uh, the benefit that will, you know, will go for, instead of going to one city, that will go to more than one city or one country. Hubin, uh, what has changed in China since the Olympics? My feeling, you know, I was involved at the opening ceremony of 2008. I have the feeling that there is a China before 2008 
and China after 2008. Do you agree with that? I think in 2008, before that, Beijing has already changed. I think before that, we have already set a series of goals to achieve a brilliant Olympics, and the people from Beijing, the local companies, are actually helping to improve everything. They actually participate in lots of exercise. And eventually, when the Olympics is actually successful, you feel like people are very happy, and more and more people from China are into sports and participating into sports activities, all kinds of. From the success holding of uh, 2008 Olympic Games, we tell the whole world that China is actually improving all kinds of on all aspects, like. Uh, all kinds of institutes, um, on hospitalism, um, and everything. You see, Chinese people are actually very happy nowadays and exciting every day. For all of you, by the way, um, what is the difference uh, based on the legacy between the hard, I would say, benefits and the soft benefits? Hard being, uh, uh, for example, the growth, employment, attracting corporations, and of course, the soft being influence, reputation. Uh, maybe we can start with you, Jim, because uh, if I'm not mistaken, a lot of corporations started to establish themselves in Australia after Sydney. Yeah, I, I mean, Australia sees itself in, in Asia, and uh, there's no doubt that uh, part of the vision of the Sydney Olympics was to put Sydney firmly on the map, map as a world city. Uh, that occurred and uh, a number of people have located their head offices, for example, in the region in Sydney. Um, I think also that the, the soft benefit in Australia was quite, quite remarkable. I mean, I mean, the biggest thing that we had that the polls told us, if you like, before the Olympics was Australians were scared that we were going to mess it up, we were going to make it a, a failure and they were going to be embarrassed around the world. And, and Sydney, Sydney was successful and it gave Australians great pride. They, they think, uh, they now know that they're global, globally competitive, they can deliver in a global market, they feel great about their country because of what happened. I mean, that soft benefit was, was the biggest benefit, I think, that came out of the Sydney Olympics. What happened in Salt Lake City? And that, uh, we had tremendous both hard and soft benefits. In terms of hard benefits, uh, $4.2 billion worth of economic output. We had 35,000 job years of uh, employment. Um, we had a profit of $76 million, which we put into an endowment to maintain our venues. Uh, to this day, um, and uh, so tremendous hard uh, benefits. We also got women's bobsleigh and women's skeleton into the Olympics for the first time in 2002. In terms of soft benefits, it was huge. Um, we uh, had an inferiority complex as a city. Uh, we always considered Denver as better than us. and. Um, this put us on the map. Uh, people, most people didn't have a clue as to where Salt Lake City was, where Utah was in the United States. You always have to say, well, we're kind of near California. Um, but um, it gave us pride, it gave us confidence as a city and as a state. And uh, number two, we are now ranked uh, number one many, many times in Fortune magazine, Forbes magazine, uh, and many other publications as one of the best cities in which to do business. We have brought many uh, headquarter companies as well as many regional uh, uh, offices of major companies to Salt Lake City today. And lastly, I would say the legacy is that we have maintained our venues uh, and become, our goal was to be the number one winter training uh, place for winter sport in North America. We have become that. What would you, would you do uh, different or maybe better bidding now for 2026? We think we start with a huge advantage. We think we're the best place in the United States for winter sport. We've got the best snow on earth. And uh, uh, 
but what we've done between 2002 and today that will enhance our bid for 2026 is we now have a light rail system. Our transportation system is amazing. We're now a model in the United States for transportation. Um, we are improving our venues. Um, we have a winter sports school for, for Olympic athletes to come and go to school and train. Um, and uh, we're, in we're building that school up. So I think we've, we've just come that much further. Watching the Summer Games, Summer Olympic Games here. Who is watching that? And who is watching the Winter Olympics? Wow, that's great. <laughs> Keep watching. <laughs> yes, please. You want to make? I, <clears throat> I wanted to. Uh, those are some terrific modifications and changes that help boost the prospects for a later bid. But I wanted to touch on your observation about soft benefits that may become hard benefits, which are in my fifth category of the political aspects. Uh, one element, this may be sensitive, but what the Olympics or the World Cup allow is for the rest of the world to observe how one treats one's own people, not only by what visitors can see, but what television guides them to be able to see. Now, for certain places like London, that may not be too mysterious, but for places like Qatar, for places that are a little off the beaten track, for places that remain like Shangri-La to a lot of people in the world, such as China, that's a really important component, and it puts a big burden on national leadership. The second part of that is the image with the outside world, and while the Chinese do not want to hear us talk about it, the torch relay is an unfortunate element of an external image factor that wasn't an internal factor, mm -hmm. but was observed by many in the world as advocacy groups used the big sport event for their own purposes. Okay. Uh, please start to ask, uh, to think about your <coughs> questions. We will take some questions in, uh, in a really few seconds. Boutros, um, in which sport Emirates Airline is involved on sponsorship and why? Uh, let me start that Emirates involvement in sponsorship is, is by itself because we strongly believe in legacy. That's why uh, we start a strategy which is, we know it should take us years, and uh, we targeted uh, major World Cups to, to cover the geographical area of Emirates, either network or future network. So in 1999, we start by the Cricket World Cup, then we move to the FIFA World Cup, and then we move to Rugby World Cup, in addition to uh, Dubai World Cup, which is a horse racing. So with the main, this main four uh, World Cups, we gain exclusivity, but in the meantime, we build up a legacy through the years. We don't go in and out because we strongly believe the effect and the result will come by building up through the years. Uh, as a brand, when you go like, we hear everybody talking about organization and about the game itself. Nobody cares about the brand. And here we are usually, we like the organizers to recognize uh, the sponsors and take them as partners and give them more room and more space to be seen. When you talk about opening and closing ceremonies, you don't see any brand. Uh, the first breakthrough we had was the FIFA World Cup 2010, where we managed, and FIFA were really kind enough, because it wasn't in the contract, to allow our cabin crew to play a role in the, in the closing ceremony. And that was the most effective branding uh, uh, element in the whole sponsorship. So uh, that's our uh, future plans and past uh, brands, and that's our legacy because we strongly believe as a company, we are here to stay. We plan for 2020, 2025, and 2030, probably. Yes, the gentleman on the left, please. If you can introduce yourself and make a very short question. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Ismi Muhammad bin Fadl al-Hamli, and I'm the Thani li al-Lajra al-Olumbiya. Bidayatan, 
انا عضو في اللجنه الاولمبيه وامبارس اوف ذا اولمبيك كوميتي ان قطر اند اي وود لايك تو كونغراتيوليت ذا جفرمنت ليدرز فور هوستينج ذيس فورم اي ثانك مستر بوترس وين يو اسك هيم اباوت وات از جوين اون ان دبي اي ونت اي ونت تيل يو از ا مان فروم دبي ذات دبي از اوكي and uh, dubai uh, celebrated uh, the national uh, the uh, uh, the 41st uh, national day and uh, we were so proud uh, to know that we are doing very well i want to add that none of the cities or the countries was not affected by the economic recession so this is not something confined to dubai only dubai is still capable of hosting of hosting many uh, sports events So I, uh, I, 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 you drew my attention when you raised the question of whether the economic recession can stop or can serve as a hurdle for a country to host any sport event. Added to that, I wanna uh, I wanna say that the legacy that we can gain from hosting any event, there are some economic economic, political, and the social benefits from hosting any sport event. Dubai, during the economic recession, benefited from hosting the sports event socially, politically, and the like. I would like also to uh, thank Mr. Sheikh Saud Al Thani uh, and I, uh, for uh, inviting us uh, to the Doha Goals uh, Forum. I just wanted to clarify things, nothing more. I am, I am very happy about your comment. My question was not innocent because, uh, because I think, as a friend, that Dubai should make more noise about the fact that Dubai is doing very well. So thank you for the point. Yes, a question here. Can we open micro number three, please? Thank you. Uh, I'm Margaret Talbot. I'm president of the International Council for Sports Science and Physical Education. I'm very pleased to see an academic on this panel. Um, but what I wanted to make the point about soft legacy and hard legacy and long-term legacy, one of the things which came out of the first international convention on science, medicine, and education in sport, which happened in Wangzhou, China in 2008 was a whole series of presentations on the way in which uh, the hosting of the Olympics and Paralympics had changed Chinese's approaches to Olympic education away from hard training, that happened anyway, but also to values education. And I think that this kind of soft legacy is often overlooked because it's only evidenced by very small academic studies. But when they come together in a convention of this kind, it's very, very valuable. That's why it's so important that Doha Goals includes the academic community and the scientific community, because otherwise we don't get this kind of evidence. We would only get the grand claims about the big events, and instead some of the values issues which the students have illustrated through their questions are so important to them, are actually changing. Thank you. I would like to take a real question now, please, if someone has a real question, which is ending by a question mark. Okay, number one, please. Um, how, do you um, how do you prioritize branding? For, this is for the Olympics. How do you prioritize branding the city versus branding the country? Very good question. Thank you. Sure. Well, I think you have to, to do a priority in terms of what the legacy you want from any event that you are hosting. Whether it will be, it's an Olympic Games, so if it's Olympic Games, means you have to look to the city itself. 
which is normally the priority, then you go look to the nation and we see what happened in London for, as an example. But if you are hosting a World Cup, then you are looking to more than one city, so four or five cities, and then you have to look all the legacy that you want to, you know, to achieve for each of these cities and then as a nation uh, as a whole. Maybe, Jim, I would like to, yeah. and to uh, hear your answer also because of uh, comparison I, I, between Australia and Sydney. I, I agree entirely. Uh, it was Sydney's Olympic Games, even though it was in Australia. I mean, Australia is a very big country. Therefore, it's difficult to spread the, the branding across the country. I mean, when you talked earlier about uh, having a regional <coughs> approach to an Olympic Games, of course, we have a football competition within the Olympics that, that tends to be all over the country anyway. And uh, it happened in Australia, it was all over our country. The torch relay was all over our country. So it's, it's very difficult when you've got a, a, a continent that is yeah. one. But that's the United States of America <coughs> do not need any branding, but maybe Salt Lake City. So how do you differentiate the city and the country here? Exactly. We didn't try to brand the country at all. We <laughs> had to brand Salt Lake City and uh, that's all we did. And I might mention, I forgot to mention, in terms of legacy uh, on tourism uh, was a critical element I didn't mention because 70% uh, of our state is national parks and is owned by the national government. And uh, it's beautiful. If you think of uh, the Grand Canyon type of, uh, you've seen photographs if you haven't been there, the southern part of our state is like, looks like the Grand Canyon. And so what it did for tourism, which is one of our major industries, was huge. Question number two. Can you introduce yourself, please? Yeah, I'm uh, Saif Al-Jawri from UAU. Uh, I would like to thank uh, Doha Gold for making us come here. Uh, I have two questions. The first question is, you mentioned the vision and how you can implement it, but you're missing the middle part. How can we overcome uh, starting from the vision until the end user. And the second thing is uh, Emirates Airlines or Emirates brand. I can see them in the world in uh, teams like Arsenal, uh, AC Milan, but I cannot see them in the UAE. <laughs> Boutros, we'll you want to answer, please? Yeah, yeah. Uh, actually, we spend uh, much more money in UAE than anywhere else in the world in comparison to our income. Uh, you don't see us in UAE because in UAE we are very well known, so we don't go to the number one events because there are number three and four events. They need a lot of support. So we support a lot of communities. Mm -hmm. We support a lot of association. Uh, for example, the handicap, we send them to the, uh, to, to the Olympics in, uh, in UK, and uh, we do more than 120 events in UAE. So uh, obviously, uh, because the big sponsorship like uh, Arsenal, the World Cup, they are, and that's why we do them, because they give us the global presence and the global uh, association with, uh, with, uh, with uh, people who are not necessarily our clients. That's why they are, we, we do it, because it's successful and because it's noticed. Uh, I go back to the same, uh, same thing, uh, small events which they are uh, within corporate social responsibility. Uh, in UAE, uh, unfortunately, out of 270,000 registered companies, we are probably 20 to 30 companies who support these activities. Uh, of course, uh, we always receive these questions, but I'd like probably people, public like you, to go to these other companies who does nothing and ask them why they don't do it. Number three, please. And then we have a question at the back also, and I will come back on the, on the right. Hi, my name is Alexis Liras and I'm um, from Georgetown University and I also represent the International Olympic Academy from ancient Olympia. The revival of the Olympic Games were based on the need of providing an educational reform, providing new inspirational framework for education, for global solidarity and by the way have Olympic Games every four years. So the legacy of the Olympic Games basically today is just around the Games. We also saw before a great Olympian, Ian Thorpe, who demonstrated how this need of being an athlete, but also a caring athlete that can do something for the community. Today, Greece, the birthplace of Olympic Games, is the worst economic situation ever. 50% unemployment of youth under 50, uh, uh, 
30 years old with no hope that things would get any better. So my question has two parts. The one, first, academic one. What do you think should be the legacy or the direction that the Olympic movement should do for Greece around the Olympic framework? And the second part, more to the practi practical perspective, how do we move from nation-centered, self-centered legacies into global legacy of the Olympic movement? Thank you. Stephen, do you want to answer? Um, I will try uh, to offer a comment. Thank you for your question and thank you for representing a Greek-based point of view. And, and as you know, Stephen, uh, we, we just knew recently because of what is happening in Greece, unfortunately, that, uh, and this was really a shock for me, that just the hockey and softball installation in Athens which are at all not used, mm -hmm. cost 50 million euros, 50, five zero million five zero. euros per year just for maintenance. Uh, that is a bridge that supports the direction I was going to go in, and it's a much crisper example. Thank Please. you. Uh, the, the support of sport, in my view, is something that might take on a larger character than just internal. That could come from other places, perhaps with the IOC as a supporting or helping entity to facilitate that. Beyond that, it seems to me that the economic and political elements transcend what any sports-based organizations can actually do, but that's a, maybe a observer's perspective from far away. To me, perhaps the biggest support that the Olympics provide, the IOC provided for Greece was the support at the front end and the fact that I think the rest of the world is aware that it was not easy for Greece and the Athens organizers to get to the starting line in 2004. So the support came before 2004. Now I think there needs to be conscious concern for supporting venues that deserve to have a continued life and also support for sport, which is the province of the Olympic movement. Chef, you want to yeah, add something, um, please? Just would like to add something, maybe an initiative, an idea. Great. That in, um, normally when you are bidding to host, they will ask you about, you know, the venues. They will ask you about the infrastructure, and they will ask you about, you know, the competitions and all the other aspects related. But we don't see it really realistically, or I mean, very precisely, from the, you know, the IF, the international federations, or from any, you know, owner of the games that they will ask you what are the legacy that you're going to do with the venue or what you're going to plan. So I think if they include this as a must that you have and it should be also evaluated more and more of the decision of which country will do because we see sometimes many promises but uh, rarely nothing to be evaluated after that. Mm -hmm. But I think if we insist, especially I know that the IOC in the last you know, maybe a few years they are insisting on that one, but not from the IF and also not from some owner of the game. So I think it's very important that we include this as uh, something that we judge which, which city should take any event. Yeah. Um, Hubin and, and Jim, uh, can you tell us what happens after the Olympics, after the Games with all these facilities? Hubin. <coughs> I participated in the ping pong, uh, in the ping pong facility maintainment. Um, it is actually held in the university when the games are ended. All the students from all over universities would actually use these venues. Uh, in Paralympics, um, actually, 
lots of like facilities for um, disabled people are actually improved a lot uh, throughout the country, including the accessible paths in like restrooms, shops, banks are actually created. So nowadays, we are all benefiting from this game. You are working on the Hubin Foundation. What would be exactly your foundation doing? The mission? Uh, my main job is to deliver speaking in all the places in the world. Like after finishing as an athlete for 20 years, I am an ambassador at the Paralympics. Um, you saw so many, you have come. You actually see you have lots of achievements after delivering the speech. When you're delivering the speech, you actually convey lots of experiences and feelings after of the Olympics. For example, like you, you shared experience cross countries, cross genders, cross nations and ethnics. So secondly, I am actually running a funding foundation. According to myself, like my own leg and my own limbs is always broken, and uh, I want to establish a funding foundation for the disabled children uh, to establish, to load their, to set up their fake limbs. Maybe I'll cooperate with the uh, banks, like for example HSBC. They are really, uh, they are really willing to sponsor us. If you, have, if you had only one initiative that you would like to build and to launch at Doha Goals, what would have been only one? I uh, think. I think Olympic Games is actually. I think okay. Actually, next time Doha goals might be held in China. Anybody agrees? Okay. If nobody raises your hand, we will go to China. Actually. Okay. Thank you for inviting us. Actually. We have to. Okay. Thank you for inviting us. Actually. We have to. Jim. What happened with all the facilities in Sydney after the games? Uh, <coughs> basically, they're being very well used, but it took a long time. And I think what she said, said is very, very true. You need a plan right up front. And in 12 years ago, that didn't exist in Sydney well enough. And the second piece was that the legacy component was left with the delivery um, for the Olympics of the venues and the infrastructure. And of course, they focused on putting on a great game, so they didn't worry at all about what the legacy was going to look like. And I think London learned from that lesson and they created a legacy company about three years out from the games, which focused only on the legacy for the venues and the infrastructure that have been created. Far better approach. Okay, so we have the time just for two very short questions. Number one, please. Um, good morning, my name is Zina Bulmaki from the African Leadership Academy. So uh, my question following up on the point about Greece is um, given the negative legacy that that has, left, uh, that has left on the country, a legacy of indebtedness for the entire nation, what are the, uh, what are the regulations that you think should be put in place to prevent such things from happening again in the future? Thank you. Who wants to take the point? I'm not very uh, short answer, very please. short answer, and difficult for professors. Uh, yeah, I, know. I, <laughs> I think that I would go back to the idea that there can be mitigation, uh, but prevention is very difficult because of the inability to predict the economic future. Thank you. Question number three. Thank you. Thank you. I'm a student from Peking University. Um, I have a question about the legacy for general public in a broader sense. Uh, let's take China as an example. Maybe many developing countries are the same case. Uh, we know that for hosting Beijing Olympic Games in 2008, the country, the whole country and Beijing city has devoted very heavily into in the facilities and equipment of, uh, to the stadium, to the 
to the other infra infrastructures. But um, I mean, after maybe these st stadium and infrastructures can also um, do a good job for the general public in Beijing. But what about the other people in China? What about people in the West? People in the north? Uh, people in the north? What about people in the West? There's we only invest in Beijing, but uh, I mean. Uh, the larger population, the most population not in Beijing, they cannot benefit as much as uh, the citizens in Beijing. So what do you guys think about it? I don't think it left a great legacy for other people outside Beijing. Hubin, do you want to answer to that why everything is focused on Beijing? Short answer to your Yeah. Okay. I what do you think about okay, sorry. everything is about Beijing, if we understood the young students? What do you think about that? How can we... Did you hear the point? Okay, you will, you will give me your answer in a minute. Sheikh Saoud wants to add a point. No, I just want to mention, because just oh, picking okay. up from whatever been mentioned, especially about the program in Athens or other programs, I think if we do another initiative for the grassroots that we put, especially for children, we put as a must for any event organizer, they should include a program for the children or for grassroots in any event, because they are the future. And I think if we do this, we are sure of the sustainability of the continuity of the event itself or from different aspects. So, um, as, you, as you see easily, we have already two initiatives suggested by Sheikh Saoud. This is why Doha Gold is happening in Doha. I would like to ask each of you very short conclusion. One, one sentence about what uh, is one, one initiative but we can work on it. 请每一个人简短地提出一个小的计划和建议. Uh, I don't have. <laughs> I come back to you in a minute. This dream. The data shows that if we can get children at uh, fourth and fifth grades, uh, uh, involved in the it will be a lifetime activity. And there are a couple of initiatives we tried in the U.S. Uh, unfortunately, they've fallen but I think we need to consider them again. During the Olympics, Nagano started it. It was called One School, One Country. And every single school in, in the entire state of Utah adopted a school in a Utah that was going to participate in our Olympic Games and had exchanges and so on. I won't go into detail. Uh, uh, the the second program with the United States Olympic Committee 呃，叫举办了一个活动，叫做奥林匹克孩子。We took it to cities all across the United States through the mayors uh, using a curriculum to get fourth and fifth grade students involved in exercise and sport and number two in what the Olympic values are. And I think we need to look worldwide at doing something like that Sp and pushed by the IOC. Stephen, I'm not talking to the professor, so a very short Very end. brief. <laughs> Sport for society, which is really the underpinnings of the Doha Goals Forum, and its impacts beyond competition itself, although they're not excluded. Sport for society. That's the theme I would employ. Bobin. I think regarding the suggestions, especially from that student, like for example, if you if you want to take a look at the nest and uh, the nest, the bird nest and other stadium, you might want to go to Beijing to take a look.
And another point, another another point is the Olympic, the holding Olympic Games is very influencing for their generations. Like maybe when they are still a kid, you know, they are still young. They saw the establishment of great stadium and they see a brilliant Olympic Games. You know, they will have a very healthy attitude towards sports. They will want to participate. Yeah, I, I mean, the one thing I would push is that you do treat legacy. You have a vision for what you want out of a, a major event like a, a World Cup or an Olympic Games, and part of that is the legacy you want to create for your country. You should drive that independently. It in, obviously meshes with what you're doing as an organising committee to put on the event, but you should drive ruthlessly the, the themes you want out of the legacy on a separate basis uh, in parallel. Which, uh, my last question, Boutros, I'm back to you, because even if you don't have an idea of an initiative... I have a lot of ideas, but they are not uh, executed. No. Uh, <laughs> what, will be the, what will be the advice you will give to Rio? I advice, it's a have to be, probably they start their legacy, I'm sure they started from now, but uh, be uh, delivered to their promises, because We've seen it before in a lot of organizations. Again, I'm not going to talk about Olympics. A lot of promises, but there is no follow-up. When you talk about post-events, you hear about billions of figures coming to the economy. You hear a lot of good statistics. But then three, four years later, nobody speaks about them. And uh, this is an area which I consider it misleading to the public. Mm -hmm. And it should be, uh, there should be some kind of organization or legitimate uh, watchdog uh, committee from various sports to follow up on deliverable because at the end of the day when the event's done is done but what about lessons to learn and these lessons they should be realistic uh, I heard a lot of diplomatic words here I don't think we should be here or any other uh, similar organization to be diplomat with each other but we should be here to be transparent honest to the sports and to deliver to the sports that's how the final word for you uh, thank you first for being a very active and committed member of our advisory board at Doha Goals. At my personal level, I would like really to thank you very much. And, uh, and uh, my last question to you, what advice would you give as a Secretary General of the Olympic Committee of Qatar to Rio? Well, uh, first I think they, as Petros mentioned, you should plan ahead. You should um, try to do everything ahead of time, not to wait. And I think the most important is to learn from the previous experience. To learn from, you know, Sydney, from Barcelona, from London, from Athens, from whatever experience that happened in the past. So you avoid whatever happen as a negative and you conduct what is, was positive and I think to concentrate more, more and more in the public around you because they are the one who will make you succeed in the end, which is not only Rio, but Rio plus Brazil as a, as a whole. Thank you all and uh, <laughs> thank you for your questions. <laughs> if I'm not mistaken, we are supposed to have a coffee break just now and then after we have the second round of our task force about solutions and implementation, which is very important. Thank you. I think the session are starting in 15-20 minutes.